Hello, welcome to Playing with Interactive Documentation. Uh, my name's Jason, we'll get into introductions later, uh, but this is what we're going to be talking about. Uh, so to kick things off, I will mention that GitHub and the Next.js community uh, have been working together for a good little while. Uh, we took on a project called GitHub Discussions, uh, working with communities like Next.js to build the feature out in the open with the community's help. Um, we wanted to take that same approach with our documentation. So this is docs.github.com. Uh, I'll mention that a couple of weeks ago, we open sourced the docs.github.com platform. Uh, it's a little Node.js app that does uh, hundreds of thousands of redirects, localization routing, versioning, rendering. Uh, it was originally a static Jekyll site, fun fact. So you can check out the engineering blog post where my colleague Zeke goes into detail about uh, how the site works and a lot of the open source automation tooling that we built. Uh, there's a lot of really weird stuff around actions and uh, external GitHub apps and that kind of stuff. It's really interesting. Uh, you can also take a look at the announcement blog post to learn a bit more about how you can contribute. Uh, and yes, you can contribute over at github.com slash github slash docs. Now, why am I telling you all of this? Well, my name is Jason. Uh, I work on GitHub's docs engineering team. And as you can imagine, we care very deeply about documentation, right? Product docs, software docs, anything that helps somebody uh, approach a new platform or project and figure out how to use it, figure out how to get value out of it as quickly and as comfortably as possible. Uh, and one thing that we've learned is that documentation is highly valued but often overlooked. Uh, I stole this from uh, the open source survey from uh, 2017, and I love this quote. Um, we depend on good docs to learn from, uh, right? We, without docs, how are we going to learn new software, new products? How are we going to implement uh, libraries into our own code? Uh, but in general, they don't get the amount of attention that they require. So that leaves us with fragmented, unhelpful docs all across the software ecosystem. So we recognized an opportunity to make GitHub's documentation more immediately useful to help people do the things they wanted to do more quickly. Uh, and so we asked ourselves a whole bunch of questions. Uh, number one was, how do people learn? Well, you know, a whole million different ways. There's no right answer, right? People learn in different ways. Uh, but in talking to customers and folks in the community, uh, we knew that experimentation and play was a core part of the learning experience for many developers. Uh, the next question we asked was, why do people come to GitHub's docs? Well, there are two main reasons. Number one is they have a very clear goal in mind. They know, generally speaking, how the systems work, uh, but they need reference material, right? So that's something like the REST API docs. Uh, or the GitHub Actions workflow syntax page. Uh, I use that one a whole bunch because I don't remember everything. Um, but then the other one is they don't know how a system works, like GitHub Actions, right? It's a new thing. Uh, if you haven't worked with something like that before, you might not, you might not know a whole lot of the concepts. Uh, so you need to sort of start from scratch and learn how this new feature or product works. Um, and this even extends into sort of more scoped features like org creation, repository creation, that kind of stuff. Uh, it may seem very you know, easy to you now, but uh, at one point, everybody has created their first ever repository and probably doesn't really know what they're doing. I have certainly been there. Um, and then lastly, where can we start? So we knew that we wanted to sort of take a, a new approach to uh, the docs and try to help people in a different way. But to get there, we have to start somewhere. Um, so in talking to customers, we learned that the GitHub Actions docs was a good place to start. Uh, it's a fantastically powerful feature, uh, but it can be a little bit daunting to get started with. So that was a clear place for some quote unquote innovation. So I want to talk a little bit about some experimental work we've done. Um, a lot of this stuff, uh, actually none of it, we've shipped uh, uh, to any customers, and I'm not sure that we plan to. Um, I'm just going to be showing you sort of some experiments that we've done internally and some learnings that we got out of it. Uh, so interactive documentation, what is that? 
how can words be interactive? Well, we think about docs as sort of a static blob of content, right? Um, maybe it has some like code examples, but for the most part, it's static. It doesn't have to be that way, right? We look at things like videos and tutorials, uh, things like REPLs where you're, you know, actively changing something. Um, and we know that interactivity is powerful. Uh, I stole this from a uh, an internal business doc about, you know, docs. <laughs> um, and I really like it. Developers come to docs to do many things. Let them discover and engage creatively through playing around. This is definitely how I learn. Um, anytime I come across a new library or something that I want to try, I just like go in and try it. I fail a million times to do the thing that I'm trying to do. And then eventually I get there. And that try a thing, see a change feedback loop is super important. Uh, you sort of build up this toolkit of small learnings every time you're making slightly more informed hypotheses, right? Based on whatever mistakes you made the last time. That's the foundation of incremental learning. Uh, I happen to have seen this tweet literally today, the day that I'm recording this talk. Uh, I could not have planned it any better. Um, the tighter the feedback loop, the faster the growth. So I suspect that this was about some like producty business thing that I know nothing about, uh, but I think it's a perfect thing to talk about uh, with respect to learning. And what's really interesting is that there's a whole lot of uh, tools for doing just that with our actual self software development lifecycle, right? CodePen, Glitch, Code Sandbox, Repelit, many more that I uh, am sure I'm forgetting. There's sort of like a whole mini industry of sandbox playground environments that are positioned for helping people experiment uh, for the sake of learning. There are tons of studies that point to play as being a major factor in successful learning comprehension. Uh, and these are some of the tools that help us get there sort of on the day to day. Being able to spin up a project really quickly, try some stuff and then throw it away, that's really, really helpful. So how can we replicate that in our own documentation? Well, let's take a look at an example of a doc site that does this really well. This is stripe.com slash docs, Stripe's SDK documentation. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, Stripe is a payment platform that uh, developers can use to basically add payment systems to their application. Uh, and of course, they have an SDK for doing that. Uh, their documentation for that SDK includes a multi-file code viewer, highlighted sections in that code, annotations around the code, uh, so you can sort of like click in and learn more. It's very, very cool. Uh, so we're going to break down a couple of different parts of it, starting with this section here. So. You can see on the left, I've clicked on the create a checkout section uh, that causes it to highlight the corresponding code block on the right side. Uh, so there's a, a very clear sort of connection between the content, uh, right? Typographically, hierarchically, that's a word, uh, displayed so that it's easy to read, right? It links out to additional uh, documentation uh, tied directly to the code, which that too has a little annotation around the word session. And here we can see a link to the code samples. I really love this. This is super valuable. Um, the more context that you can provide for learners, the more likely they are to learn from the surrounding information, right? We don't build, uh, we don't write code in a vacuum. We write code that works with other code that works with other code and other files and other assets. Uh, showing as much of that as possible is only going to be helpful, right? Do what you can to sort of isolate the most important parts, present that up front, but then also give them ways to find the sort of supporting information. Uh, plus which having all of this, like all of these code examples of version control is just helpful for you as a maintainer of the docs. Uh, should anything change, right? APIs change, uh, you know, code examples have to change sometimes. Uh, all of that is still available by just, you know, chucking it into version control. Um, I want to talk a bit about Scrimba, uh, scrimba.com. It is a beautiful example of so many of these concepts sort of built into one Frankenstein monster application. Uh, I say that lovingly because it's awesome. 
Um, it's a multi-file editor. It follows a guided tutorial. There's a video that you can like control, you know, play and pause and stuff, but in an editor that also changes. Um, it is an interesting approach to interactive tutorials. I would love to see this kind of stuff show up in documentation or other kinds of learning platforms. Um, I think it's really, really interesting. So we took all of those learnings and concepts and said, well, let's try to build something separate from our existing tooling in about a week, you know, time box it and see where we get. We had some design mockups to work from and some sort of like general thoughts kicking around. Uh, so we started on a project called Docs Playground. Um, I wanna be very clear, we're not shipping this to customers. Uh, it was purely an experiment that we learned from uh, some of the concepts and features we might bring into docs.github.com in the future. Uh, now that uh, the repository is open source, uh, you can absolutely open some issues there if you have any thoughts or ideas. Uh, so we built this little application in Next.js, provided a very quick way to have a server-rendered React app. That was important. Uh, documentation sites really, really rely on good uh, search engine optimization. Server rendering is pretty vital. Um, and we had full control over the back end, which was helpful in case we wanted to do anything like super weird, like with authentication or any kind of stuff like that. Um, we use TypeScript because TypeScript is great. Uh, Monaco uh, is Visual Studio Code's text editor, uh, sort of yoinked out into a separate module. Uh, that's what uh, makes the code editor that you see on the right side of that screenshot work. Um, it's very powerful, and it was really, really great for us to experiment with. Um, and then we used Primer, uh, which is GitHub's wonderful CSS framework. Uh, it sort of works like Bootstrap or Tailwind. Um, it's really, really awesome. Now, the first thing that you'll see here, uh, I'm, I've am i picked out a couple of the um, components of this just to sort of take a, a more detailed look at. Um, so the first one you'll see is the GitHub status bar. Um, it's just a handy little feature that shows the status of various services in the GitHub ecosystem. Um, this was not hard to implement, uh, and it's something that I'd love to bring over to docs.github.com. We just sort of have to find a place for it. Um, the next element that I highlighted here is a video. Uh, so like I said, people learn in so many different ways. Uh, so we thought about adding videos to support the article itself. Um, ideally, we'd remember that you sort of got more out of the videos uh, than the text and maybe recommend it over the example code and uh, over the text. But, you know, we just kind of experimented with it and we'll see what happens. Um, and then here, similar to what we saw with Stripe's documentation, uh, we wanted to tie co uh, content to the code blocks that it describes. Uh, we did this using Monaco's highlighting features. Uh, and when you click on a section of the code, uh, it actually scrolls you and moves you over to the corresponding content. Um, we really like this approach. Uh, this helps to keep learners sort of looking at the right things, uh, moving them around to ensure that they're seeing the appropriate content for the code, uh, making sure that we're uh, highlighting what's, you know, what, what's actually relevant to what they're trying to figure out. Um, I think there's a lot more that we can do around these UIs, but again, total experiment mode. Um, so we're not going to look at too much code here, uh, just because there's a lot of it and it's not that interesting. But uh, I just want to show you a couple of breakdown things. So this right here is an example of an article. Uh, because we're just you know in a time boxed experiment, we just chucked everything into, into a JSON object uh, using JSX directly in it for the actual body. Uh, the end goal would, of course, be to write Markdown or something like that instead. Mm -hmm. Uh, because, you know, documentation changes all the time. You want to make sure that you're writing it in a uh, language that's comfortable to change. Um, and then right here, you can see uh, this highlighted areas section here. Uh, this shows which uh, lines in the code editor a given section corresponds to. So a start and end line. So this is a simplified look at the editor component. Uh, we're using Monaco, uh, and we're storing a little bit of information once it has mounted. So storing some things in refs and state. Um, that lets us set up 
these refs in state to uh, know whether or not the editor is sort of uh, uh, mess withable. Um, and then in this use effect hook, we are taking that uh, uh, highlighted areas array and uh, transforming it into some decoration deltas. So Monaco is very, very pluggable and configurable. Uh, we're calling this delta decorations method on the editor ref. Uh, and when we do that, we pass uh, a series of objects and you know arrays and stuff uh, to basically say, these are the decorations that we want to change. Uh, we're using these uh, primer classes that define, you know, make it blue, basically. Uh, we have to do a little bit of maneuvering around uh, the particular API to make sure that we're uh, returning a full range instance. But that's basically what we're doing here. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the difficulties of playground style content, uh, because you know, certainly it was not without its challenges. And this is stuff that we're learning as we go and, you know, plan to uh, uh, sort of consider more deeply as we're adding it to docs.github.com properly. Uh, so the first one here is that technical writing with uh, static content is hard. Um, technical writing is difficult enough as it is, uh, but adding elements of independence and in play makes it even more challenging. Um, as soon as you allow your readers to sort of play and interact with something, it can be difficult to tie that back into a learning objective. Uh, you sort of need to create boundaries to make sure that they don't play too far away. Um, each interactive can feel very separate, and that might mean a lack of consistency across your content. That's okay as long as it makes sense to the readers. Uh, and from an engineering perspective, it's the same as building an application, right? You want to not repeat yourself as much as possible, um, but sometimes you have to be comfortable writing sort of like one-off code for each of these little interactive example things. Um, and then lastly, uh, users do weird things, right? Interactivity is hard. You're, you're asking people to have control and be able to change stuff. Um, and you need to expect them to do something that they're not supposed to do. Um, users, as soon as they have the opportunity to mess with something, they will mess with something and then, uh, you know, write to you with bugs and stuff. Um, so your interactive elements have to be fairly resilient or sandboxed uh, to make sure that uh, users don't sort of break the rest of the site as they're sort of trying stuff out. Um, and lastly, I want to talk about some uh, really productive learnings that we took out of this. Uh, so some things that we want to yoink over to docs.github.com. Um, the GitHub status bar, that's a clear win. That's something that we should have right now. Um, it wasn't hard to implement, should be easy to drop in. Uh, code blocks that are separate from the content. Um, we really like this approach from a layout perspective. Uh, it helped to sort of pull stuff out, talk about it in isolation. Um, I think we need to think more deeply about uh, how you tie that those code blocks into content, make sure that there's like a clear relationship there and it's not just like code and content uh, on two different sides of the screen. Um, but that's, you know, sort of the, the goal of what we're looking for. Um, next videos, they proved really useful. Um, I think we want to try some other ways to present them and, um, you know, make sure that out of date videos, uh, they can do more harm than good. Uh, if they're, you know, presenting information that's just straight up wrong um, or out of date. Um, however, we really like trying out these different methods of learning. Uh, I think we're going to try out a whole bunch more, um, maybe some sort of more interactive elements. We'll see. Um, and then interactivity as a whole. So this is going to sound obvious, but as soon as we started adding, you know, React and like a lot of client side interaction, um, we started to think think and, you know, the, the gears went uh, around, um, you know, unlocking a whole new area of potential functionality. That sounds obvious, but it's a pretty fundamental shift from uh, something like an old Jekyll site. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, I've written a whole lot about uh, documentation, both product docs and software docs. Uh, you can check out this blog post to learn more. And then uh, if anybody has any questions, concerns, anything, uh, you can ping me on Twitter at Jason Etko. 
Uh, I think I'm doing a live Q and A now. I'm not actually sure, um, but I'm also in Discord again at Jason Etko. Uh, you're welcome to ping me with any questions you have, uh, and that's all. So have a nice rest of your conference watching day.